From Wondery, I'm Mark Ramsey, and this is part three of Inside Psycho. Spring, 1959, Beverly Hills. Why Frank Freeman, the head of Paramount, is sitting poolside in a towel and slippers. His teeth are gripping his cigar with such force, he's almost biting off his tongue. You could say he's steamed. You could also say that's an understatement. A butler brings him a phone. It's Barney Balaban, Paramount's corporate president. Barney. Barney, I know. Don't, but don't yell at me, Barney. I can, I can hear you. Yes, Hitchcock is out of his mind. Yes, I've read it. I know it is. I know it is, Barney. I know. Look, Barney, we both love Hitch. Nobody's been better to Hitch than Paramount. But this is too much. This is grotesque. Sweetie, sweetie, you're splashing me when you swim by. Please keep the water to yourself. I'm on a very important call here, Barney. Barney, I will explain it to him. This psycho thing is garbage. None of the paramount prestige. I mean, nudity, violence, a guy dressed as a dame. And Barney, there's a scene with a toilet. A toilet! This is never going to pass the production code. And I am now president of the MPAA, which means I'm in charge of the f***ing code. But Hitchcock had made up his mind. And his agent, Lou Wasserman, had already secured the rights. But what to do about Paramount? Wasserman had an idea, and it would go down as one of the greatest business deals in Hollywood history. So here's the deal, guys. That's Wasserman in a smoke-filled room at Paramount. Freeman sat on the other side of a vast mahogany table and listened intently, if unenthusiastically. So here's the deal. Hitch will direct Psycho for free. He'll make it with his TV crew, he'll make it fast, and he'll make it cheap. You guys pick up the tab, you distribute the picture. It'll be a Hitchcock film, not a Paramount film. Hitch will own 60% until you make your money back, plus a piece of the gross. After that, all revenue and 100% ownership goes to Hitch. And to keep your hands clean, the picture will shoot at Universal, where Hitch makes his TV show. Well, Freeman sat stunned. (laughs) I mean, here was the deal. With a little bit of upside and almost no downside, how could he say no? But here's the thing. Wasserman, Hitchcock's agent, was head of the company which owned Universal. So Wheeler Dealer Wasserman had just stolen his most important client from Paramount and sold him to himself. Some people think Hitchcock mortgaged his house to make Psycho. He didn't. Instead, he simply mortgaged his future. Meanwhile, Team Hitchcock was in agreement on one thing. This was the biggest mistake of the boss's career. Some members of his staff departed. Another got to choose between profit points on Psycho or a raise. She took the raise. She would come to regret that one day. The key to Psycho was its surprise twist, and Hitch wanted to keep that twist a surprise. He ordered his assistant to visit every bookstore in L.A., she would buy up every copy of Psycho she could find. This secret was too good to get out. Could a 60-year-old legend break with his big-budget past and create something as dizzyingly shocking and innovative as any young Hitchcock wannabe? That was the question Hitch asked himself as he stared into a glass of fine imported wine. He hoped he knew the answer, Now there was just one problem, making a movie that all the experts called impossible. 
and proving just how wrong the meddling suits at Paramount really were. Hitchcock hired one writer and then another. But before there was even a script, Hitch made the biggest change to the story. The fat and dowdy middle-aged serial murderer would now be young, trim, and handsome. Many murderers are very attractive persons. They have to be in order to attract their victims, Hitch said. And he knew just who he wanted for the role. August 18, 2016, Los Angeles. Paul Jasmine is a famed fashion photographer and artist. He sits by the window in his apartment on Wilshire Boulevard in a great old building in Hancock Park. I have the best view, he told me. The back of my building is just covered in palm trees. I could be in the South Seas. Yeah, it's kind of cool. Paul was a lifelong friend of Anthony Perkins. Tony Perkins was one of the smartest people I ever knew. We were both in the Warhol scene in New York when we met. One of his closest friends was Stephen Sondheim, so you can imagine the wit that he had and that intelligence. He was a huge Broadway star, and we just became friends. Then he came out to Hollywood, and I moved out here too. Tony Perkins knew all the big stars. They all gave him their home numbers. They would come to regret that. Paul Jasmine. Tony had a dark sense of humor. One of the things he loved most was to invite people over. He would give me the phone numbers and I would crank call them. Yes, that's right. Anthony Perkins crank called all his co-stars. Jasmine did this great voice of this shrewish old lady and Tony couldn't stop laughing when he heard it. Okay, Paul, how about Marion Davies? Hello, Marion. Yes? Marion, I'm so glad you're at home. It's Eunice. Yes, I'm at home. I'm sorry, who is this? <laughs> it's Eunice. We were together at that party that time at that thing. Eunice? Yes, yes, Eunice Ayers. How are you? Well, just fine, Eunice. Thank you for calling. Oh, Marion, I'm down the block with the family, and I'd love to stop by. I can be there in five minutes. Tommy and Billy miss you so much. This is Eunice. Eunice Ayers, Marion, oh, good grief, it's good to hear your voice. I can't wait to see you again. I'll be right by. <laughs> and so it went. Tony Perkins recorded many of these sessions, and among the friends he amused and entertained with the recordings was Alfred Hitchcock. Before Tony had even read a script, Hitch had already signed him to star in Psycho, but in these hilarious recordings... Hitchcock heard something else he wanted. He heard the voice of Norman Bates' mother. The bigger the star, the more shocked the audience will be when she's killed in the first 20 minutes of the movie. But she also had to look like she came from Phoenix, where the opening scenes take place. Hitchcock and company viewed footage of dozens of potential Marion Cranes, including Piper Laurie, who was later Sissy Spacek's mother and Carrie, Hope Lang, and Shirley Jones, who was best known for big screen musicals and would later be famous for a new generation as the mother of the Partridge family. Hitch finally settled on the one actress with the balance of softness and inner tension and with the perfectly ordinary look, as he put it, of a Phoenix native. That person was Janet Lee. The crew spent plenty of quality time in Phoenix. They took a ton of pictures there. They even grabbed women off the street to photograph their closets, their dresser drawers, their suitcases. Unlike most movies, the wardrobe for Janet Lee would come right off the rack. But how would audiences react when the character they're rooting for is murdered in the first few minutes of the movie. This is really going to throw them for a loop, Hitchcock said. Always the prankster, Hitchcock loved his practical jokes, especially the ones played on the audience. What was it like to work with Janet Lee? Well, 
Tony Perkins didn't like her at all. That's what Tony's friend Paul Jasmine told me. But why? Well, she was kind of crazy, Paul said. You just didn't talk to her. She really, really wanted to be a movie star. Crazy Hollywood actors, imagine that. As Norman Bates says, we all go a little mad. Sometimes. September 1959, West Hollywood. Casting was done. The screenplay was complete. Hitchcock and screenwriter Joseph Stefano sat at Hitch's favorite table in his regular booth at Chasen's, the legendary L.A. restaurant frequented by Hollywood types. Three years later, Elizabeth Taylor would have several orders of Chasen's famous chili flown to the set of Cleopatra in Rome. But today, that chili was part of a lunch celebration. The waiter poured two glasses of one of Hitch's favorite champagnes, Dom Perignon 1959. Although the vintage was new, only 306 bottles were made. If you're lucky, you can find one today for $85,000. They raised their glasses for a toast to Psycho. To Psycho. Hitch took a tiny sip and suddenly appeared very sad. After a year of haggling, after months of writing and rewriting, storyboarding and casting, after all the pre-production tasks required to bring a motion picture to the starting gate, what's wrong, Stefano asked him. The picture's over, Hitch said. Now I have to go and put it on film. Psycho was ready to shoot. It would come in at a thrifty $800,000 and would shoot in a speedy 36 days. And it would become one of the most famous movies in cinema history. To Psycho. November 30, 1959. The sun rises on a cool day on the Universal lot. Today is the first day of Psycho. Alfred Hitchcock has gathered cast and crew for a brief meeting before production begins. Okay, okay, can I have your attention, please? Before we begin, I want to impress upon all of you the importance of keeping the plot of our little picture a secret. There is a twist in our picture, and the full impact of the suspense of this picture requires us not to spoil that twist. That means this set will be closed. It means I will be the only one doing interviews about this picture, not Miss Lee, not Mr. Perkins, I alone. And I want to make the audience suffer for as long as possible. Audiences like to put their toe in the cold water of fear, so I implore all of you, don't turn off the spigot. Raise your right hand and repeat after me. I promise. I shall not divulge divulge. the plot of Psycho Psycho. under penalty of death death. death. or worse, worse. a brilliant future in community theater theater. and not on any screen big or small ever again. So help me God. So help me God. Now, lights, camera, action. The opening scene is set in a hotel room. Marion and her lover Sam have spent her lunch break um, not uh, having lunch. She's in a white bra and slip, quite racy for the time, and he is shirtless. Now is a good time to talk about Sam, Sam Loomis. When Hitchcock was casting Sam, MCA pressured him to hire one of their clients, John Gavin. Gavin was contract beefcake at Universal. Hitchcock had seen his work and was monumentally unimpressed. 
I guess he'll be all right, he said. And by all accounts, he was barely all right. Despite the taboo context, the risque dialogue, and the barely there wardrobe, the erotic heat between the two actors was, well, icy. Shirt or no shirt, Gavin was just too much of a cold fish to make the scene work. In private, Hitch called Gavin the stiff. Cut. Janet, uh, can I can I have a word? Hitchcock took her aside. I'm not getting what I need in this scene. I'm going to shoot it one more time. This time, when you and John are on the bed, I want you to, I I I, I want you to take take matters in hand, as it were. Janet wrinkled her brow at him. Take matters in hand. Okay. Now she understood. She blushed. Action. There was no pun intended, but Janet did indeed take matters in hand. And the effect was, evidently, convincing enough. Print it. You had to have some sympathy for Gavin. Years later, he said his hot blood was cooled by the strong scent of body odor. Or was it the director's breath? Or maybe it was the cigar Hitchcock was puffing on inches away from what was supposed to be a passion-filled love scene. As Hitchcock biographer Patrick McGilligan puts it, that's the way the tryst opening of Psycho plays. Audacious but awkward, provocative but cold, sexy with a whiff of B.O. From that point forward, cast and crew who saw the dailies noticed that when John Gavin was in a scene. It was, more often than not, the back of his head. Hitchcock was not always so attentive. Lorraine Tuttle played the sheriff's wife. That's the scene where Sam and Marion's sister, Lila, are visiting the sheriff at his home, searching for the whereabouts of Marion. Tuttle played the scene beside the sheriff, but as she looked over at Hitchcock, He was slumped in his chair. Is he sleeping through our scene? That's what she asked the assistant director. Oh, no, 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 that's a good sign, he said. He's designed the scene and your movements so carefully, he knows how it's going to look, he's just enjoying the sound of it. With his eyes closed. Long before Where's Waldo, Long before M. Night Shyamalan inserted himself into his own movies, Alfred Hitchcock made the cameo famous. Even the crew was in the dark until the last possible minute about where, when, and how the master of suspense would make his ever-so-brief appearance. Part of the fun of any Hitchcock picture is catching the fleeting but distinctive image of the director in the periphery of the scene. In North by Northwest... Hitch misses a bus as his credit darts off the screen during the title sequence. In To Catch a Thief, Hitch makes the bus and even snags the seat next to Cary Grant. He's often seen walking along the street or outside a window in his movies. In Psycho, there he is, early in the movie, loitering outside a real estate office window in a Stetson as Marion rushes by. In that office, work Marion and her associate, played by Hitch's real-life daughter, Patricia. It wasn't uncommon for Hitch, his daughter, and selected cast and crew to share a glass of wine over lunch. Oh, but not just any wine, and not only wine. Mr. Hitchcock's package has arrived. The assistant director got the honors of opening the package. A case of Montrachet, the only Chardonnay Hitch drinks, imported directly from France. And foie gras from Paris? You see, Hitch had a network of accomplices for fine food and wine worldwide. He'd call Maxime's in Paris and order the foie gras. Then Maxime's would deliver the food to a TWA pilot who would fly it to the Los Angeles airport and hand deliver it to Hitchcock's driver. Off goes the driver to the set of Psycho with his precious cargo on the passenger seat. Customs? (laughs) 
the wet customs. Hitch loved his food, he loved his wine, and he loved his movies. All of this was warm-up to what would be the most challenging sequence in Psycho, the shower scene. This was the moment that Hitch would kill the star of the movie and shatter audience expectations forever. This was the make-or-break scene in Psycho. As he arrived at Universal that day, he was literally sick to his stomach. He knew in his heart, in his soul, that this was perhaps the most important scene he would ever shoot. And it would go down in history as the most famous movie scene of all time. It would take seven days to film, 78 setups, 50 cuts, and the final result would last less than three minutes. I create nightmares for the audience, Hitch later said. I play with an audience. I make them gasp and surprise them and shock them. The shower scene would have to do all that and more. Or else, Psycho would be a bust. And the failure would be all Hitchcock's. One last puff on that cigar. Time to risk it all. Next time on Inside Psycho. From Wondery, this is a six-part deep dive inspired by the story behind an unforgettable classic movie. This is part three of Inside Psycho. We'd like to learn more about you. Please complete a short survey at wondery.com slash survey and subscribe to this show on iTunes, Stitcher, the Wondery app on Android, or wherever you listen. It's free. For more information and to comment on this show, visit our website, wondery.com slash inside psycho. If you like the show, we'd love you to give us a five-star rating and a review. It helps others go inside psycho too. Written and narrated by Mark Ramsey. Sound design and editing by Jeff Schmidt. Produced by Mark Ramsey Media. Executive producers Jeffrey Glazer and Hernan Lopez for wondering. Please thank us by rewarding our sponsors with your support. Tell your friends about this show. And mother, thanks you. <laughs>